But you know, there, how many good centers are there left in the NBA today? We could talk about that. I mean, yeah. how many of you know right off the top of your head? Yeah. I can't think of very uh, many. And back in the day Duncan's when we were kids, so it was like, yeah, I mean, Duncan was, was like ready to retire. You had, uh, think about it, you had, uh, well, and Duncan plays like a power forward. He, he shoots yeah. a lot of outside. I mean, but you had Wilt, Wilt, you had, well, back uh, then, yeah, back, you had Wilt, you had, uh, uh, you had uh, Russell, who was only 6'7". Russell was only 6'7"? Well, generously, he was. He was listed at six nine. He was more like about six seven or six eight. But Rick Barry really? was listed. Rick Barry was listed at six eight. He's no taller than me. I stood. I know Rick Barry. I worked yeah, with yeah, him. Yeah, yeah, stood yeah. eye to eye them. He's, a, he's maybe a half an inch. What is it with guys? You know? Uh, or, it's, or, it's like or, it's no. It's a team. It's like oh, we got big guys. Look at our lineup. You know, and, and it's kind of hard to fool people. But yeah, you but give the, them an inch here, an inch there. But the guys know themselves. I mean, like if I'm Kevin Durant, I know. How big I am? And I go, wait a minute, you're not six nine, you know. <laughs> you know what's kind of cool about Oklahoma City? You, you got, um, you've got Stephen, what's his name, Stephen Adams? Uh, yeah. From New Zealand. Yeah. You've got uh, Serge Ibaka from Nigeria, Stupid. and you have Enos Kanter from Turkey. So you got three different. Yeah, yeah. And then last night you had Anderson Vayet Ver- 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 from yeah. Brazil. So you had four different parts of the world in that. Yeah, Serge, that. I thought he was. Who's that? Very no, no, he's from Brazil. No, Sir Jabaka. No, Sir Jabaka is um, Sir is from Nigeria. Yeah. So you got Azili, who's yeah, uh, who's from uh, well, his dad's from Nigeria. Yeah, his dad is. He was born. He was actually born there, but he was raised here. That's why he doesn't speak with an accent. Oh, okay. So, yeah, that's kind of a. I don't know though. I everybody said, oh, the Warriors got it back in and made, but you know the thing is, they're still playing. If they if the series goes seven, they still have to play three games down there. And that's not going to be easy. I mean, it's you know you watch Durant. What and he's been he's been kind of fumbling the ball a little bit in the back. Well, the second half. half. I don't know what happened in the second half. Yeah. It was he was killing it the first half. The second half he just dropped off. Yeah, but it's kind of, but it, 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 it just when you, when you shoot. Right. Yeah, when you just you watch him shoot and you just that's no matter where it is, you just go. It's going in. Yeah, no, you do. In the Clay first Thompson, half, he was. Clay Thompson's like that though. Yeah, and it's funny. Clay Thompson had an off night last night. I yeah. think he had two of nine three point attempts, but Curry would hit, I think five out of seven or yeah. five out of eight. Curry was stroking and he had yeah. it going last night. This is after he goes flying into the crowd. That guy's wow. amazing. Yeah, that's pretty amazing. He's amazing. And, and fortunately, Draymond didn't throw the ball away too much. That's Draymond, what Draymond was kind of just playing the Draymond game last night. That, yeah. you, know, you know what helped them was their bench last night. Oh, my gosh. Tremendous. You know, whether it was Spates or Azili or, you know, Harrison Barnes, who was not on the bench, but he got a, he had a, some nice baskets. And did you see the offensive, and even Livingston? See, I keep, I keep yelling out to the TV, offensive rebounds. You didn't think oh, yeah, no, they did a great, they much did. better job. Ergo kept going and they, going. They, they actually out-rebounded a bigger team. Yeah. That's what you have to do. And ergo, look how much they yeah. won. They, well, they, they outplayed them in every facet of the game. That, and sure. the night before, they outplayed them for the first half, and most of the second, and the, most of the third quarters, they've only been outplayed, really, for a little over a quarter by this team. Wow. You know? Yeah, so that yeah. leads you to believe, you know, on the surface, well, the Warriors should be able to win this thing. But, you know, it's a seven-game series. Yeah, because Westbrook, gosh darn it. He's, when he gets hot, watch Ooh, out. He, he didn't do it last night, but he's, he's scary. Yeah. He's scary. Okay, uh, so what what kind of topics do you want to... I'd say the NBA playoffs, we can talk a little bit. Ba- like talk a little baseball? A little baseball, yeah. yeah I also yeah. Uh, want to talk a little bit about national, uh, about... The NBA teams that draw a national audience. Sure, yeah, sure. You know, whatever you want to talk about. If you want to talk about some business thing, uh, you know, business aspects, that's yeah. fine too. Whatever you, whatever you want to throw out there, I'm, I'm game. I'll turn right. off my phone here because there's <laughs> last night I was right in the middle of the, right. the interview session, and my phone I forgot to turn the volume down, so it was I was posting something. I'm right in front of Curry. Curry's like, oh, I guess. Sorry, sorry, sorry. I'm turning it off. You know, everybody's like. Bruce, was that your phone? You gotta turn your phone off. Come on. How do you like the the guy who took the picture? You see that? Oh, God, I can't believe that. It's like help Steph up. No, I gotta get a picture so I can get it get it on the YouTube. Would have been better would have been like this. <laughs> yeah, I got pictures. I curse like this. Like, <laughs> <laughs> selfie. Don't get that selfie in there. Gotta get that selfie. Come on. Come on. All righty. Um, got our cans here. I guess I don't need the cans today, do I? No, I don't. Oh, oh. I don't need them. Yeah, I mean, only if you wanted to, like, because if they accident, well, you're not, you don't yeah, do that. No, I don't want the cans. It's the cans. cans. I wonder where they came, that came up with that. That's what they used to call That's what they call them, microphones? Cans. No, uh, these. Oh, cans, because they, they kind of have, they look like cans. I guess. Kind of crazy. Yeah, they're crazy. Uh, okay, well, let's just kind of. Oh, we got to do our opinion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, let's. Whoa. 
welcome. You're listening to Sports Econ 101. You know our show. It's where we discuss sports topics from a business perspective. I'm your host, Edward Brown, along with my co-host, Bruce McGowan, longtime sports radio personality. Allegedly. Allegedly. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're not that old. Well, well, no, it's been a while. No, actually, I did it for a long time. It, it was a long time at one radio station, KNPR. A lot of fun. A lot of fun? Yeah. So what was it like uh, talking to Christy Matthews? And, uh, <laughs> no, <I'm> <laughs> Actually, you know, I th- I've talked to some old guys, but uh, anybody past maybe Willie Mays' age? Mm. Uh, I'm trying to think. Uh, the guy that just passed away, who was it? The played with the Brooklyn Dodgers back in the day. Well, he didn't just oh. pass away. I'm trying to think of the, the pitcher, um, Joe Black. He was a guy I always used to talk with. And uh, that was a fun team. Well, well actually, we had... Um, uh, Yogi Berra ketchup, uh, ketchup, Ke- backup ketchup. Yeah, Charlie Silvera. Yeah, Charlie yeah. is probably the oldest baseball player I know today. He's ninety-six years old. Yeah, yeah I don't know how many old, older ones are even out there. No, not too many. Those are my dad's age, you know, the generation. Those, those yeah. are special guys. Very good. Yeah. Okay, so uh, what we're gonna do? We don't have any special guests today, so it's just uh, you and me. Just you and me, you pal. Me, you and me, kiddo. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> and uh, each commercial break, we're gonna ask a sports trivia question, and we're gonna give away a vacation to uh, the first email with the correct answer and the uh, vacations are not sponsored by the radio, not sponsored by the radio station but by lighthouse resort and marina and where and is lighthouse resort and marina that is located about one hour northeast of san francisco in the delta in area. the delta nice area, area. Yeah. Yeah. nice area with the water and, uh, yeah. and fishing very and underrated area if you ever visit northern california the bay area that's a place to drop by and check out it is and the yeah. vacations are free their only request is a hundred dollar cleaning fee to cover the housekeeping expenses check them out at the lighthouse resort and marina just make sure you don't trash the room too yeah, 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 don't do that. Yeah, okay. yeah you know, they're, they're being nice enough to give us these yeah, vacations. Yeah, thank you. Treat it with respect. <laughs> Treat it with respect. Yeah. Today's trivia theme is random trivia. I always have yeah. to keep you in suspenders. Yeah, okay. This uh, segment of Sports Econ 101 is sponsored by Pacific Private Money, providing mortgage investments that are currently yielding over 8% wow. secured by real estate. I like that. Doesn't get any more conservative than yeah. that. Check them out at PacificPrivateMoney.com. Stay with us. You're listening to Sports Econ 101. Of course, you know I'm a true conservative. <laughs> and then when it comes to money, <laughs> yeah, fiscally conservative, yeah. and the, you know, I tried to, I'm trying to get uh, a better auto insurance because my auto insurance jumped up from 110 to 290 dollars because I had happened to have in six months a small um, fender bender that was my fault, where I backed into another car that was not moving, nobody was in it, and. A, I glided through a stop sign, and a cop just happened to be there. 175 bucks. So I got two within six months. So my auto insurance went from 110 to 290 per per month. Per, so what, what kind of car do you have? Uh, golf, Volkswagen Golf. That's a lot. I mean, well, what kind of coverage do you have? Well, I got you know the standard coverage, you know, the normal stuff. You, so okay. 100, 110 was reasonable, you know. Going yeah, up to 290. Know. Well, you know, it's the problem was I got put under bad driver status for the next two years because I had the two. Things within six Who's months. your insurance company? State Farm, but they all, you know, I, I, I've had them for years. They've been great. I have chapters. Also, this guy told me, he says, the auto insurance industry right now is just really, really tight about this. And so I shopped around. I went to AAA. I went to, I've gone to several places and I can't get really much better. So finally, I've gotten one that looks like it's going to be working. It's uh, through the uh, armed services. Uh, my dad was a, a Oh, so the Air Force, the, the, the uh, USAA. Veteran. Yeah, and USAA. So you, you can get, get a, you know, I can get about half as much. It will cost me about half as much. So they, and it's funny because I'm the only reason I'm eligible is because I'm a son of a veteran. Wow. I tried Geico. You're son of a veteran too. Yeah. Even Geico wasn't that much cheaper. It was like two forty. And I go, what, what's the point? You know? Well, you know what? Uh, you might want to look at what you are covering yourself. I mean, like. Oh no, I know. I know my coverages. You know, and, and, they, and they say, okay, well, you can take it less if you want to take a, a smaller deductible. And then you're a larger know, deductible. Larger <laughs> deductible. I mean, you know. Yeah. I mean, what, like, what helps you do deductible? Oh gosh, I think what I had to pay when it was my my fault. I was like five hundred bucks. I had to pay out of my pocket. And then See, the rest how much of it was for a thousand. Yeah, but the rest of it was yeah. like, yeah, it might be worth it. And then also, uh, I mean, this is what I do. Yeah. Is, is I I have the highest deductible. Right. Uh, I do have comprehensive because right. someone goes up. Yeah, you don't want to be without that. Yeah. But I don't take collision. Really? I figure I figure if it's my fault, I'll pay for my own car. Okay. But I do have full liability. Okay. Well, and that's uninsured good. motors. Okay. Yeah, just something sort yeah. of, you know, to, to check out. Maybe. Yeah, it's interesting doing all the shopping around this stuff. All the yeah, that, is a, that is a lot of stuff. Yeah, it is. 
make Claude happy. Did not make Claude happy <laughs> when no. she found out she was coming. Kind of, because 180 bucks more a month. A month yeah. yeah. Do you have? Uh, I mean, do you have up. other insurance with them? Like no, I have homeowners through AAA, and I went to AAA, and I said, how about if I bundle? And the guy was really nice yeah. about it. He tried to put a package together. He says, you're only going to save like 10 bucks a month, he says, on your it's, auto insurance. You didn't say farm to try doing homeowners with them? Uh, you know, my, homeowner, my State Farm guy suggested that he could yeah. look at it, so I'm, I am going to look into yeah. that. Yeah, if they bundle it. everything, a lot of times Yeah, maybe I, I can make a profit, yeah. yeah. But uh, if, state, if uh, AAA can't, I don't know if State Farm can't, but we'll see. Yeah. Yeah, got yeah. nothing to lose by trying. See, I'm an expert in life insurance, but not yeah. in that stuff. Yeah, I, I know yeah. enough to make me dangerous. Yeah, yeah. Okay. There you go, my friend. All righty. You ready? Yeah, always, always ready to roll. Here it comes. Welcome back to Sport Econ 101. I'm Edward Brown, your host, along with Bruce McGowan. So, before we get into basketball, I wanted to bring up one thing. I saw yeah. a little thing on uh, on Yahoo Sports. It said, "I work for Yahoo Sports, by the way. Oh, for the for their radio network." Oh, okay. Yeah, very, yeah. very good. All right. Yeah, yeah. Well, but then you, maybe you saw this post that found that 9 out of 10 Native American... Actually, I'm sorry. Did I say Yahoo? Yeah, yeah Yahoo Sports. On, on Yahoo Sports, I saw the article. It was actually the Washington Post. Okay. They, okay. they post. They yeah. Post, okay. yeah, yeah. Sure. So apparently 9 out of 10 Native Americans are not offended by the Redskins name. Interesting. I wonder where that information comes from. And I'm not saying I disagree with it or agree with it. But... but yeah. They are offended by the football record. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, Robert Griffin the third or whatever his name was, uh, they always used to call him RG. I was RG3. RG3 yeah. That guy, he, he looked so good at first, and yeah. then it just it all fell apart for him. And now he's in the process of, of trying to reclaim and salvage his career. I've always found the Redskins, it's funny, when I was a kid, I used to think of that, and we never really thought about it because it was yeah. always the movies and the TV shows, the Cowboys and the Indians, it didn't really bother me. And then as we got older, you know, I just thought Redskins. That sounds, you know, it's kind of has it, a. It, it does have a feel of. Yeah. Uh, I mean, Chiefs, I think, is okay. Chiefs Braves is okay. Is okay. And Braves is okay. Here's the interesting thing a little history on the, on the Redskins yeah. franchise. They were owned by a guy named George Preston Marshall, who was a very successful businessman and a very good owner. Unfortunately, he was a vicious racist who did not integrate his football team until 1966. There was not a. I'm sorry, 65. Not a black player on his team until that time, and he traded for a guy named Bobby Mitchell, who was Jim Brown's understudy. Oh, yeah. And uh, Bobby Mitchell has a great story because he did not want to. The league forced him pretty much. To, You're going to have to integrate. You know, go get yourself an African American player. Here they are in, the, in one of the, the most densely populated African American yeah, exactly. areas. Yeah. So he gets this uh, Bobby Mitchell. Bobby Mitchell tells the story, and uh, they, I guess, at some pregame luncheon, they're all singing the national anthem. And they are getting up and singing. And Bobby Mitchell said, "I didn't. I believe it or not, I didn't know the words." And George Mar Preston Marshall is looking at him, "Sing, Bobby Mitchell, sing, <laughs> sing." <laughs> <laughs> I guess it, you just mouth the word. He just made. He just went. Like, I just went. Yeah, 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 yeah. It looked like I was saying on what I was doing, you know. But it was. It was kind of funny to hear that. But, you know, it's yeah. funny. You'd think that that owners would look at winning first and everything else. Well, I think they are now. You know, by and large, I think in that in that time it was a different era we lived in, and. There were there was a lot of institutional racism. This is the 1950s and 60s. But they weren't you know? the first, though. I mean, it's it's one thing if you're if you're like Branch Rickey trying to yeah. break it, you know, and then you, you know you're going to take some flack. But if you know six, seven other teams are doing it, I mean, I, you know. Yeah, but, you know, it was interesting. Branch Rickey, there's an interesting guy because he's always been given credit for being this this pioneer, and he is. Yeah. But here's what he was really a pioneer. He was a pioneer in a new idea. We've got to change. We've got to get baseball to to be a up to date with everything else, and if we don't bring an African American player in, we're cutting our own noses off to spite our faces. And it turned out to be a brilliant movie. You think about the 1960s and 50s, especially the 60s, was a great era for oh, baseball because yeah, oh, yeah. you had a, a huge number of blacks coming in. Willie Mays, Hank Aaron, you know, Juan Marichal. I mean, it just yeah. uh, the, the list is endless. And think about it: 20 years previous to that, those guys never would have played. What a what a loss for the game it would have been. Now uh, you were mentioning about how you, you said. What did he say he was going to, you know, lose out? Well, he Over felt that he felt? Branch Rickey felt at the time that baseball was going to integrate eventually. And he thought, well, we're in Brooklyn. We're in a multicultural environment. Gotcha. We're in a fairly, uh, you know, content environment as far as there's not, too, there's not too much racism here. You know, there's a lot of different cultures here. This is the perfect place to do it. Yeah, it wasn't the South. I mean, it was, no, you know, no, you know, and, and, and it was a very bold move. And it was.
was, you know, it, it did open. The, it was kind of interesting. Ironically, it, it, it marked the end of Negro League Baseball, which was a very successful independent franchise um, or concern. And it, within, I think, seven years, Negro League Baseball went away. And for a few years there, not many blacks got a chance to play baseball at any level because there was a quota in Major League Baseball and the Negro Leagues were gone. So it was kind of a... It had kind of a counterproductive. Yeah, as I said, it was almost worse yeah, for them. It was for a short time, but the players, I think, to a man, would tell you, even if they didn't get a job, they wanted to see. Baseball was such a big sport when you and I were little little yeah, guys, oh, yeah. wandering around, as yeah. we remember. It was such a big part of our cultural identity and the fabric of this country. And and uh, you know, when I was a kid, and I'm sure when you were a kid growing up, you're a little younger than me, but. You know, I grew up here in the Bay Area. You grew up here yeah. in the Bay Area, where Willie Mays and Willie McKen, all our yeah. all our heroes were black or Hispanic yeah. that played. I'm not all of them, but a, a good sure. portion of them. And you can't imagine that team would be existing without Willie Mays or Willie McCovey yeah. or Juan Marichal. Well, and especially you know when I was a kid, and obviously when you were a kid too, yeah. soccer wasn't big out there. No, it wasn't big. It had its, its it had a kind of a cult following. Now it's huge. It's huge. It's so, huge. so you really had baseball, and yeah. you, and you had football. Yeah. I mean, hockey really wasn't there. Hockey and wasn't there. Was still, you know, hockey, the kind of, hockey is kind of like soccer in the sense that it has yeah. a huge audience, but it's kind of a cult audience. It's yeah. not. And then here in the Bay Area, even though the Sharks are, you know, skating towards a possible Stanley Cup uh, final for the first time in their history, you don't hear a lot of talk about it. Everybody's talking about the Warriors, though. Everybody oh, yeah, is yeah. talking. Even the non-basketball fans, my my in-laws who, are, who love baseball and could care less about basketball, actually watched a game the other night, a playoff game, the Warriors were in, rather than a Giants game. I was I was shocked. You're well, not watching a Giants game? No, no, it's not that big a deal. We want to watch the, the NBA conference. Well, especially finals. we're not talking the World Series or playoffs. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. yeah, you know, yeah I'm I'm the understand. same way. I like yeah. baseball more than basketball. Yeah, but, me too. Uh, but I've been the same way. Yeah. You know, got to watch. Well, I have games. to. I have to say this from a fan standpoint, and I'm going to get out probably a little trouble for saying this because we're not supposed to be fans. But you know, you have to be. I, my feeling is a sports announcer years ago, a very famous one, told me says if you're not a fan of the game and you're a sports announcer, you're a fake because the biggest sports fans are sports announcers or sports writers because they love being around the game. Yeah. And I will say this, the Warriors have become such a fun team to cover, to watch, to just to get to know the players on a peripheral basis, that I've had as much fun watching this team and, and covering this team, and, and I don't cover them on a regular basis, but I go to a fair number of games, than I ever have covered any other sport. And it's yeah. just been a lot of fun. And that and that brings you to the, the point of just being so enthusiastic that you, you just enjoy it. You don't try to compare it. Well, you see the camaraderie. Yeah, you know, I think that's a ma- that's a major thing. They all seem to be rooting for each other. It's a stuff. small group too. The basketball, it's, yeah. it's more of a family. So you really there's an intimacy there. And if things go sour, boy, they can go sour quickly. But if they go good, whew, yeah. you know, it's amazing how quickly it can it can. And that's why I think the Warriors right now, young team, relatively speaking, if they can keep their core together, Oklahoma City, same thing, should be around for years. Now. How old is Westbrook? Westbrook is 27, I believe. Okay, all right. And That's Kevin Durant is 28, and, same and, age as Steph Curry. And uh, uh, Adams only 23. Adams is 23. Yeah, he's from New Zealand. And they have an interesting team. They remind the Oklahoma City Thunder remind me in some respects. They're very different, but the way they're they're put together reminds me of the San Antonio Spurs. All these yeah. players from different parts of the world. Adams is from New Zealand. Ibaka is from Nigeria. Canner is from Turkey. I mean, it's just it's an international collection. I like to see that. That's kind of fun. The, the Warriors have a couple of Brazilians, you know, and an Australian on their team. So. I think I think honestly, it's it's awesome from a world peace standpoint. Oh, it, yeah, it really is. Because yeah. rather than it just being you know our country against yours, like the yeah. Olympics, you know, it's it's hey, it's, it's the best it's of the, the best. best of the best. Yeah, know? I mean, there are probably a few international players overseas that are playing right now that could be in the NBA and it would probably be fairly good. But I think by and large, the best players in the world are in the NBA, and how can you not like that? Well, you got to figure that uh, it's well, kind of similar to integrating the Negro Leagues. You know, Jackie Robinson was really, really good. He had some other aspects that Grant Tricky wanted, right. but his play, I mean, he was really at the top. Yeah. No, the thing about him that made him special, it's interesting, he was a very proud man, and Jackie Robinson, though, was also extremely intelligent. He went to UCLA. He was an All-American football player. And Branch Rickey knew that even though he was very proud and very intense, that he could count on his discretion that first year. And he told him, he says, you're going to have to turn the other cheek. And the thing was, I think that's really, I hate to oversimplify it, but I think that's one of the reasons Jackie Robinson died so young. He was only 54 when he died. 
because he carried a lot of his anger yeah. that first couple of years and just, you know, growing up in America at the time with well, him. Well, and, and you can imagine had he lost, quote, lost it on the field. I mean, and he did, well, he didn't lose it eventually, but he yeah. he did not turn the other cheek after the first year, but that first year he had to turn the cheek yeah. so many times. But, but, but because he did, that, yeah. that really opened the door for It did, and that's why Brian yeah. Rickey chose him, because yeah. he knew he could, he, he, I, the phrase was, you're smart enough to, you know, to take it, but not, I mean, you won't take it personally, but you can turn the other cheek. Exactly. Okay, yeah, we're going to cut to our first commercial, yeah. our second commercial break. That was too much fun. It's going by so fast. Yeah. Okay, how many times has Michael Jordan won the NBA's MVP? Ah, All right. good question. Uh, that's our question. Email edward at sportsecon101.com. The answer to that question, all right? Go touch that dial, sportsecon101. I'll be right back. That's a good one. Yeah, that's, uh, that's I know it's over two, but I don't know how many. I'll just have to take a guess. Yeah. Because I know he's won it consecutive years, and he's also won it a couple of different four times. And, uh, his team has won six titles. You know, I, I remember before the Bulls became a powerhouse, he was scoring, I think one year he averaged 42 points a game or 38 points a game or something ridiculous. In the, mid, in the mid-1980s when he was a young player, he was amazing. He would score, you know, he'd come into a town team would lose the game and he'd score half their points, you know. Well, that, you know, that's what was going on uh, last night with uh, uh, Kevin Durant. He scored all oh half their God, points in the first three quarters. Yeah. He did. And then Curry just te- Curry just took over that game. Hit three threes, so, four free throws. Remember on the one play he got yes, three, four, four, four free throws and then he had a little runner. They, so, you know, these refs seem to be... I they're they're not, bad. I don't know. I think it's going inexcusable. On? We should talk about that. It's yeah. not excusable. Not at all. Welcome back to Sports Econ 101. One more time, I'm Edward Brown, your host, along with Bruce McGowan. First trivia question we asked was, how many times has Michael Jordan won the NBA's MVP award? I'm going to say four times. You're close. Five? Five. Five times. Five okay. Times. Yeah, I know he won it back-to-back once. I know Steph Curry just won it back-to-back with the Warriors, and, and they said that there's, I think, six guys that won it back-to-back. Now, that's a good trivia question. Who are the six guys that won it back-to-back? I know, I think Shaq, or no, Kobe. Kobe, yeah. Kobe, uh, Jordan. Curry, and I'm going to guess going back maybe into the days of Jerry West or Robertson or yeah, I was going to say Alex Bill, oh, Bill Russell, Bill Russell, yeah. Bill Russell, yeah, and Will Chamberlain. Now, and the funny thing is that Curry's the only one that's won it unanimously. Yeah, so you kind of wonder was there a chip on the shoulder of the voters, you know, or or was it there was another player who was so good that it was close? Yeah, I don't know. Good question. But, yeah. Okay, so we were, uh, at, at the uh, break, you and I were just talking a little bit about uh, watching the basketball games and. and Referees. Yeah. What is going? It's weird. They're yeah. referee, They're calling these weird fouls. They're yeah. not calling them at all. I think they're just. I think they're just. It's like athletes in the postseason. Some are really good. Some aren't very good. And I think the, unfortunately the guys that have been chosen, and they're normally reasonably good refs, yeah. have just not been up to snuff. And, and I'm talking about the Warriors, Oklahoma City series because I don't know about you, Edward. I haven't watched a whole lot of Cleveland. Toronto so That's far, but the first two games of the Warriors, Oklahoma City, especially the first game, there were some ridiculous calls. It's like, hello, or, or calls that weren't made. And then, you know, we talked about Paul uh, about Westbrook um, traveling, traveling late yeah. in the first game, and it was obvious, right in front of right Steve Kerr, right in front of everybody, <laughs> well, you right missed it. <laughs> right front, and then the refs later said, oh, we blew that one. Guess what? We blew it. Well, that's this cold comfort to the Warriors. They ended up losing by six. Yeah, and, those, so, and they were like down. By three, they would have the ball back in seconds. Yeah, left. with a yeah. chance to tie the game. Who knows what would have happened? But uh, yeah, but unfortunately, the Warriors don't have any three-point shooters. No, so. they don't. You know, in defense of the referees, though, Edward, I will say that I will say that that's right. No three-point shooter in that game. I will say this: this is a very difficult sport to officiate because there's so much movement yeah. away from the ball and around the ball, and you know, so many different angles. And, and I think the other sports are a little easier. Hockey's tough, but hockey's, tough, yeah. hockey's not is, is tough because there's a more space. There's more. You know, space between yeah, the players. Baseball usually. is easier. Cause baseball is the easiest. <laughs> football is not easy, but you have enough guys out there that usually you don't screw it up, and yeah. you, know, you don't see terrible calls in football that often. So when I haven't, you know, I haven't been going to the games. I've just been right. watching on TV, DVR, and all You're that. better off not driving out, though. Oh, I know. Because I of the traffic. It's crazy. It's just, just crazy. And also here, it, it, what goes on is 
uh, I've, I've been recording the game and, and watching then it on watching radio, after, right? exactly. Because you've been doing other things, right? I've been doing other things, yeah, yeah. And, and actually, I like doing it because then I can kind of go feel the commercial. Yeah, there you go. So, I know a friend of mine does the same thing. So, I, I hated it. I called him up once. I said, "What'd you think of that game?" Don't, Don't tell, tell me! It. I'm watching it I right the, now. I, I did the same thing. I went did to you? A, yep, I yeah. went to a. Uh, You're uh, up in your man's cave watching the replay. That's it. Because I was at a men's group, and I told him ahead of time. I go. Don't tell me anything about the game. And everybody's I've got their cell phone. <laughs> yeah. right? yeah, of course. And one of the guys says, he goes, he goes well, well, Curry Lynn in the audience, but he's okay. I go, don't tell, don't tell me, me that. Anything. I don't want to hear it. Yeah, when I didn't even know it was Curry at first. I just saw this player fly into the audience, and I'm up halfway in the crowd where the uh, Augustine Press is. And then I realized, somebody says, oh, it's Curry. And then he's, nobody's coming out of that pack, and all these people are craning their necks. And I guess there was some guy with a camera <laughs> taking pictures. <laughs> At, like least, at least he didn't do a selfie. Yeah, yet, can so. you imagine putting his face right next to Curry? Hey, <laughs> selfie, smile, Steph. Yeah, 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 yeah really. It was interesting because after the game, Stephen Curry had a bruise the size of a tennis ball in his yeah. elbow, and he was nonchalant about the whole thing. No big deal. He's a tough little dude. Yeah. And I say little in all due respect. He's 6'3", 190 pounds. But he did one good thing, Edward, a couple of years ago. He went to the weight room. He's not a, he's not a big husky yeah. guy, but he, he put on some weight and some muscle because his legs, his uh, ankles were really bothering him the first few yeah. years. You that's remember right. he had some injury yeah. problems. And, so. and that's, uh, you know, one of the things in basketball, too, is you don't really want to, unless you're like a center or something, you don't really want to bulk up. No, Because you it, it, it makes you too tight. You can't really shoot very well. Well, you're not as quick. And Curry yeah. relies on his size to get in between everybody. And, he, and the, the way he moves his body sometimes, it's just balletic to watch the moves and the, and the way he, I've never yeah. heard that term, but that, well, I understand what you mean. It is. It's like watching a, It's like watching Willie Mays, you know, maneuver after a ball in the gap uh, that's windblown back in the day. I mean, Curry is, to me, next to Joe Montana, Jerry Rice, Willie Mays, you know, and maybe Reggie Jackson, uh, Ricky Henderson. There's a handful of athletes who, that we've had here in Northern California in pro sports that are up at that level, and, and Rick Barry was one of them too. And he's he's right there. I mean, he's yeah. amazing. You gotta appreciate the great ones when they're in front of you because you know they're not gonna be great forever. Just oh, like you and me, we're gonna point. move on someday. What? We're gonna, gonna be doing this show forever. That's right. That's right. <laughs> Three years now, right? Three years. Three years. Three years. Yeah. 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 Well, you were mentioning about the, uh, the the referees and how hard it is to watch basketball or, or to or officiate basketball. And, you know, where they have three referees, right? Three referees. So no, no. I, I'm watching the, uh, uh, you know, DVR, and, and of course, you know, I'm mostly watching the guy with the ball. Sure. So when I see a foul, I go, wait a minute, where is that? Where's yeah, the foul? Yeah, and it's away from the ball, and it's, you know. That's the hardest watching. part. If you're a referee, I mean, there's a natural instinct, I would think, even as a ref, to watch the ball more. But you have certain guys, I guess, that are, I don't know how it actually works out. It works, exactly. They, you got to well, figure that at least. They could probably consult each other ahead of time. Look, I'm going to watch this area, you watch yeah. that area, you watch the ball. And exactly. they probably just, that's how it goes, I'm, I'm assuming. It's interesting. We used to have an announcer out here on radio for many, many years in the 60s and 70s named Bill King awesome. in the Warriors. Great announcer. Great announcer. Any of our listeners have ever heard of this guy. He was a, a master wordsmith. And he Loved basketball. And he did football and baseball. He did, did the Raiders, did the yeah. Warriors, did the A's for years. Yeah. And he actually died the two months or two weeks after he did his last A's game. Yeah. He was 78. But he, he used to do the Warriors. I think he was great at basketball. And he hated the refs. And one time after a particularly bad game at Madison Square Garden, he says, They've opened up the doors here at Madison Square Garden to remove the foul odor left by these officials. <laughs> Jerry Lober can complain about all the booing and all the People complaining about his, you know, officiating, but he is a paragon of ineptitude. <laughs> do, you, do you remember Bill King's uh, thing with the, uh, the, was not the Sea of Hands, it was the uh, uh, the Holy Roller. The Holy Roller, yeah. yeah. John Madden is on the field. John wants to know if it's real. They say yes. Get your big, big butt, butt out of here. <laughs> he does. <laughs> I wonder if John Madden ever. Well, if you watch that thing. play, it's a, it's a remarkable call by Bill King because it was, I was at that game. I, that was the first Raider game I ever traveled to with them. And I'm watching the ball, and I'm thinking, what's going on here? What, this yeah. is the craziest thing I've ever seen. Then I see Casper recover the end zone, <laughs> and Bill King had the presence of mind to announce exactly what was going on. I could just see some of these announcers, oh, they're not going to allow this play, oh, you know. Yeah. Well, I, I thought it was brilliant. Wasn't it, it was Casper who kept kicking it. Well, what happened was Stabler, it was a, for those that don't remember that, that this is a play that happened in early 1978. The Raiders are in San Diego. They had to score a touchdown. There were eight seconds left in the clock. They had the ball at the 30. Stabler rolls Ken Stabler, the left-handed quarterback of the Raiders, goes back to pass, is hit by a linebacker named Woodrow Low, and fumbles the ball. And if you watch the replay, you can see Kenny's hand sort of throwing the ball forward in an effort to fumble it. 
And he was saying, I was trying to get rid of it so that maybe somebody would pick it up and run with it because I couldn't throw it. I mean, to have the presence of mind, when well, you know that, the clock was coming down, yeah. I mean, you're going to lose the, the game. But, I mean, that's... that's well, that's and he lot. later admitted, by fumbling it illegally, which he claims he did, that should have been a penalty against the Raiders right there. That was yeah. not called. Then Pete Banizak, a big, burly um, veteran running back, tries to pick it up, knocks it forward. He said later, I was just trying to knock it forward because I knew if I picked it up, I'd get, I'd get tackled right away, which he did, and it rolled and rolled, and it rolled to about the five-yard line. Dave Casper said, I was trying to pick it up, but I realized I didn't I didn't want to pick it up until I saw that big, fat, white goal line. Yeah. When I crossed that goal line, that's when I fell in it. But, but just, a, I mean, it's one thing to kind of, like, we're talking about yeah. it and go, okay, if, once you start fumbling, okay, here's the play. Well, I don't but, think that I don't think they planned it to be like no, that. No, I think no, they were. It was like one of those freakish things they hoped. But, but something as you're, crazy I mean, as you're in the moment, right. you have the presence of mind to realize, gee, if I pick it up now, I'm gonna get tackled. That's whatever. that's, you know like, I mean? that's, that's a that's, great that's, athlete thinking yeah. ahead. I mean, Pete Benazak had played in the league for 12 years, I think, at the time, and he realized, you know, he was in his mid 30s. He realized, I'm at the 15 yard line. There's five guys around me. I just better sort of push it forward. So he fell on it, and as he fell, he kind of. He watched his hand, he kind of, so he, he illegally batted it forward. And then Casper just fought. That's so funny, Casper's reaction, he falls on it, they kick the extra point, they win the game, there's no time left. Casper picks it up and scores, and then just nonchalantly hands it to the referees like nothing happened. And I asked him years later, I said, Dave, weren't you excited? He goes, because I was just so tired, I just wanted us to get off the field and get in the locker room. I just wanted to have a cold beer. I mean, seriously, that's Dave Casper for you. Of course, you know, like, the, you should have. Ball. Kept it for a souvenir? Yeah. I think he did, maybe. Did, did he? I don't, okay. I don't know. You know? I mean, Speaking of souvenirs, did you hear Jim? I think it's Jim Craig, the um, the goalie for the U.S. hockey team that won the 1980 gold medal, is selling off all his memorabilia for $3.5 million. Wow. His gold medal, his, the flag that he wrapped himself up in, his jersey. I mean, I, I don't know if the guy needs the money, but I mean, if you... Three point five million is a lot of money. Yeah, you know, I mean, how much? Did I'd that... sell my sister for that. Well, you have you've had thirty five years to enjoy the the memories of that memorabilia. Do you really need it around your house that much? I, you know, if you have kids, grandkids, you want to. Yeah, no, yeah. that's a good point. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you, you don't you don't take that stuff with you. Yeah, yeah, you know, I mean, I, I'm I'm as sentimental as the next guy, but hanging on to stuff that many years anyway, I didn't mean to go on a tangent. Well, or right. just that's worth that much. Yeah, I right. just and we, and we ought to do a show sometime on sports memorabilia and the market that exists today. And how much it's gone up? That'd be fascinating. Get an expert on it. Well, yeah, interesting. Yeah, well, well, you know what? When we get back, remind me. I'll tell you about some baseball cards. Oh, and, and man, I've got a bunch at home. Yeah, okay, well, we'll talk. Yeah. we'll go through every single one. Oh no, <laughs> that's a lot of cards. <laughs> 1955 through 1990. That's what I have. I, have, I don't have complete sets, but I got okay. cards from every year. Okay, uh, yeah. after 1985, probably most of them were not worth. Not that worth that much, unless it's a big star. Uh, even yeah, then. even that. Even then. I mean, I have 50. Mark McGuire rookie cards. And they're not worth anything. They're much. not worth anything. What are they worth, like a 20 dollar. bucks or something? No, I mean a dollar. Well, piece, you know, maybe. The, the market has also dropped down for baseball cards. I tried to sell some recently, yeah. and the guy said, oh, no, uh, it's dropped down like 50, 70 percent. Exactly. Less. Yeah. Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll yeah. cover that next week. Okay. okay. Who is the last NFL player to drop kick a point after Ooh. a point after a field goal? Oh, a point after. Boy. Point after. Yeah, you can, well, you can actually do that. Yeah. You can or actually field do that. That's yeah. right. Not out, but or. Yeah. Right? I don't See, know what if you can do that. I'm trying to remember who that was. Yeah, it, it, it's got to be, i got to think that it had to be because it got fumbled. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So you do it purposely. But if you turn you, the ball, ball, you'd kick it off the ground and hope it would go through the goalposts? That's a stretch. Well, I mean, if you fumble it, then you just be at the end. Yeah. You know, you know, now, is it not drop kicking a punt or a kickoff? This is an extra point or a, or a field goal, right? Yeah. Wow. Now, I've never, you know, to be honest with you, I've never heard of that. So I'm, I'm totally lost there. But you will know the player. Okay. Oh, okay. Old, old time player, right? Not, not too old time. Not, I mean, not, you, you not, Lou, not Lou Groza, then? No. Okay. No. John Stenderud? No. John Stenderud never had to do that. John Stenderud was the first great soccer style kicker, though. The way I always. Gary Premi, you know, the, the Goglak brothers, you know, Stenru. Now they all kick that way. Yeah. Nobody kicks. Remember Tony out. Franklin, barefoot? Yeah. yeah. I forgot about Tony Franklin. Or how about Tom Dempsey had this who had this stuff? Yeah. In fact, I remember Tom Franklin. That's illegal. He should have he's got an advantage, you know. Yeah. Maybe it's really funny. I have a relative of mine that owned a nice company in 
at New Orleans in his family ice company. He was in the family for over 100 years. I went down to visit him and the family there once, and I asked him about Tom Dempsey because he was the big hero of that 63-yard field goal. You know, Tom Dempsey is nothing but 240 pounds of blubber. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. He was a big guy. Yeah. Big boy. It's the Lions. Big boy. Yeah, he had the deformed hand. Yeah, remember it's yeah, like a stump a in, a, in a half a foot. Yeah, I had I had a, a friend who, uh, story. who told me that they wanted to miss the trip. His dad wanted to miss the traffic, so he left about two minutes before the kick. Really? Yeah. God. Ah, he's never going to make that story. Yeah, that's too good a story to make up. Yeah, too exactly. De- too depressing a story. <laughs> too depressing, yeah. All right, here we go. All right. Well, welcome back to Sports Econ 101. Bruce McGowan's my co-host. I'm Edward Brown, your host. Who was the last NFL kicker to drop kick a point after or field goal? Uh, clueless. Doug Flutie. Doug and, and Flutie? And it was a point after. So I kind of uh-huh. think that it had to do with uh, fumbling. Yeah, you know, okay. Doug Lee did a lot of things. You remember the miracle uh, Boston College. Pass, Boston College. I remember it's watching that game. It was a national yep. televised game because Miami was, was a top team. Yeah. And I was in a bar of all places. I used to don't drink very much, but I was in a bar with a friend of mine who sadly was an alcoholic. I realized no. at the time. <laughs> Hoopers. No, we're having a couple of. Oh, your fault. Yeah, yeah. We're, it was in the middle of a Saturday afternoon in, in a place. You know, normally here in the Bay Area, nobody's going to really pay attention to Boston College, Miami, but people yeah. were mesmerized by that play. I remember everybody was like, Whoa, what happened? I still remember him jumping up and uh, he was a he was a good quarterback. He was, he was small, but he was good. Well, and the thing was it made that that kind of made his career and sort of yeah. made him a legendary figure, is what it did. When you when you make a great play, George Blanda, there's an example of a guy that he probably would have gotten the Hall of Fame anyway because he played until he was forty yeah. what, forty four years old Basically, or forty yeah. forty six years old, forty eight years old. He was forty eight yeah, when he retired. Yeah. But he had this one string where he had five weeks in a row where he threw touchdowns or Field goals in one game, so that kind of cemented his spot. He was 43 at the time. That couldn't hurt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, that's pretty amazing. Yeah. Okay, so uh, we before we cut the break, yeah. we're talking about baseball cards and stuff. Yeah. Okay, so uh, I I also have a, a fair amount of baseball cards. You, know? you do. Yeah. I do. You have them in in, uh, in like uh, cellophane wrappers. Some and, of them. Some of them I just have in, in just you know just boxes. Yeah, and yeah, stuff. yeah. Sure. Not worth much. But, what years? Uh, what, mine only go back to like '65. Oh, well, that's fair yeah, amount. That's pretty yeah. good. There was a time when I was selling them for like, you know, seventy-five cents or a buck a piece yeah. for, for unknowns. Where would you Where would you sell them to? Yeah, down the street. To be honest. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah sometimes I do some trades, yeah. but sure. And the and the the reason I said, you know, I've never even heard of them. Okay, like as an example, Tom Dukes, right? Tom <laughs> the Dukes. Seattle Pilots. Seattle Seattle Pilots. Oh yeah, so you remember? Yeah, okay. I remember. Well, I remember because. You remember if you're a baseball card collector like you and me, you remember all these obscure players. Yeah, and I, I still remember the, the the picture of the guy too. Yeah. I still remember that. Yeah. Anyway, it's like, okay, who who would even care about his card? But some of these collectors, they want a yeah. full set. They want the full set, and they they like that obscure play. You know, Fritz Peterson, who we had on the show recently, the former Yankee pitcher. Every day he posts baseball card pictures of some of his buddies. That's he, great. he had a one on the other day. Dan Ford, you remember the outfielder with the Minnesota and the Angels back in the seventies. And he was a pretty good player. Played about twelve years, mostly in the seventies. But his nickname was Disco Danny Ford because <laughs> he he was a big disco dancer and a good one. So you know that's what I love about it. And they, and they have it on the back of his card, Disco Danny, that little ah. cartoon of a guy you know dressed up with the with the bell bottom pants and, and dancing the night away with the big chance. afro hair. <laughs> I love that stuff. Love that era. That was a fun era to be a, a kid. So um, we, we had uh, Mike Zaitlin on uh, some time ago. Yeah. Like, you were here for that. I don't think I was. Um, okay, so Mike, uh, he's, he's a big uh, sports fan. Sports fan. Nut sports nut, yeah. And he, was, he was telling me that, uh, okay, you know how uh, when we were kids, you get the baseball and you get all these autographs right, on it. Sure. I never did that, by the way. I didn't do the, I didn't do the baseball yeah. autograph. Stuff. I actually did. I did it one time with the Houston Colt 45s. I went to there. Oh. I went to the Jack Tar Hotel and I got 12 right. guys to sign it. Rusty Staub and Bill Morgan were two of them. Okay. That so, was kind of cool. Now, can you imagine getting a baseball with both Lou Gehrig oh. and Babe Ruth? Babe Ruth. Well, they played in the same team for how many years? You know? But it's worth more if you just have Babe Ruth. Really? Than just if you have a different baseball with Lou Gehrig. Interesting. Because there aren't many baseballs that have just the one signature. Interesting. And so one just scratch out the other one, you know. Wow. But because back then, baseballs were really expensive. Kids couldn't afford That's one true. baseball. And in baseball games, people don't realize this, but... Even up until the 1920s, uh, they did not, they only had like a, maybe 12 game, uh, 12 balls in a game. So the ball would get thrown and hit in the crowd. They asked the crowd to give it back. It would get the 
a pitcher would spit licorice into it or you know, tobacco juice. By the time he was done with it, it was all brown. I mean, yeah. The, now, if, now if, it, if a ball gets a little scuff mark on it, out of the game it goes. One pitch, you know, that's the end of your your career. Baseball, you're gone. Batting <laughs> practice for you. You know, that's your that's your fate from here on in. Okay, so the baseball cards, though. Um, I remember there was a time in the early '80s that you know was, baseball cards were starting to get. Yeah, the 80s was a fun kind of period of early 80s and mid 80s yeah. was a period of sort of renewal of baseball cards. Okay, but then the, the, big, the big players, yeah. you know, what they do, they, they go, oh, well, this is good, so we'll just flood the market. Yeah, and, and so 1985 with, you know, Corey Snyder and Murray. Right? Yeah, well, I remember also you had Tops for years was the only company. Yeah. Then you had Donruss. Right. Then you had, you know, Fleer. Score and Fleer and yeah. all these companies. Then you had. Mother's Cookies. Mother's That's Cookies. Company. That's which, right. Which actually, some of those are actually worth a lot. I've got all the Giants Mother's Cookies from 1983 to 1997. That actually might be worth something. Yeah. Because, again, some of these points are good. Really? Mother's Cookies? But yeah, yeah. No, it's worth a lot. Thing. So I've got, I've got boxes, I mean, literally, probably seven to eight boxes of baseball cards in in uh, binders, and they're in, in plastic holders. So okay, well, that's, a, that's all organized. Do it. Yeah. Well, the, the uh, card shop down the, down the street from us there, uh, you know, walked in. Is that still in business? It is, yeah. yeah. Because yeah. they yeah. can make the money. I, did, I just know the card business has taken a terrible beat. Oh, yeah, for, for literally almost 30 years. Yeah. 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 And, and literally, you know, yeah, so I got, uh, you know, I got a bunch of these uh, uh, Mark McGuire, um, you know, that you told rookie him. cards. Yeah, he said, I'm not interested. Yeah, he has, I, and he, Points to a tub, uh -huh. and the tub's probably got ten thousand cards in it. Right. And he goes, I, I, he goes, I just give these away for free. And, and, and I started looking through it, and there were some pretty well-known players. Yeah. And he was then, giving them away. Yeah. Oh, okay. yeah, he, yeah. Yeah. And I said, well, what cards are worth anything? He goes, well, well I can't stand like business if they give away cards for free. <laughs> well, he doesn't want to take up the space oh, with it. Yeah. He's got too much. Money. We should go down and get some cards just for fun. I know. <laughs> <laughs> do you take a whole handful? Does he let you do that, or you just say pretty take much? One? No, no, he's yeah. pretty, he's pretty generous with it. Yeah. Um, but uh, so I said, well, you know, what do you, what do you sell? He goes, yeah. well, it'll be like you know, like today, Bryce yeah. Harper. Bryce Harper would be yeah, a big. That one. would be big. Or how about Hank Aaron, nineteen fifty-seven? That would be. A well, big that one. would be big. Yeah, yeah. Maybe, yeah. Oh, yeah. anything uh, in the seventies is uh, still worth something. Really? Yeah. What about the sixties or fifties? No, it, it is. Yeah, okay. it, it, uh, I mean, it's especially got to be a well-known yeah. player. Or no, I've got a lot of well-known players from the sixties and fifties. So I want to get some. He had, he did have a Christy Matthewson card. Really? Yeah. Because I know they didn't make baseball cards on a regular basis until the fifties, but they did have collections oh, of them. Yeah. For instance, the most valuable card I think in the history of baseball is a um, Honus Wagner tobacco card. There's only twelve of them that were in existence, and you'd get them in a with a pack of cigarettes yeah. back in the day. T106 or yeah. something like that. Something the, like 1918 or something. You know? uh, 1909. 1909. Oh, my God. That's yeah. really coming back. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, but a little couple years before I was born. Just, just a few. Just yeah. a few. In fact, it, it's, uh, it's, it's funny because you look at those cards and it's like a cartoon. Yeah, that's right. Well, a lot of times in those days, they, they would literally uh, they take a, what's called a daguerreotype. It's an old black and white photo. And then they colorize it. They made it look kind of... That, that's what they must have done. Yeah, they yeah. colorized it and it made it look sort of surreal, but it did look real, but it was kind of yeah, kind of like a little artsy, you know, actually. Well, nice. some of my favorite baseball cards that I have are actually not very old, right. but they look old because they took, like, literally Cy Young. Yeah. And they took it, like, when he was uh, toward the end of his career. Right. It's literally a black and white photo. Sure. And they just made it look like a regular card, and then they have the statistics on the back. Interesting. So it's kind of weird looking at all these statistics, you know, I, I love, I know. I love the baseball something. cards that when we were kids, we learned so much about baseball from the cards. We we learned, first of all, where the guy was from, how big yeah. he was, how many years he played, you know, how many years he played in the minors, what his batting averages were. And, you know, and as kids, we were, I don't know why kids have this memory, because a lot of them have memories of minutia, but we remember Willie Mays' batting average in 1957, you know, or we remember how many home runs he hit in 1965, and you just... Uh, you know, 20, 30 years later, somebody would throw a question out. Oh, I remember that. And, and someone had a 56 game hitting streak. Who was that? <laughs> <laughs> Joe, Joe DiMaggio. Yeah. Who, but, interestingly enough, lived down the street from where I live now for a while. He brought Marilyn Monroe over to Fairfax, which is not far in Marin County from San Rafael in north of San Francisco, because he wanted to, to get her away from all the paparazzi and live in a quiet area. She hated it. 
They hated it. Spent two months here and just couldn't handle it. Yeah, but back then it was a little different. But it um, was really was it, quiet. Was it just too peaceful? Quiet? It was or too was quiet. It just too weird. It's just, <laughs> no, God, in the fifties it was very. It was an Italian enclave. You know, Fairfax. All, Fairfax was very Italian. There were a lot of people that moved over they, from oh, the no, San Francisco and, 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 and yeah, no, and uh, the uh, uh, they had a little thing called the uh, Marin Town and Country Club. It was almost all. Italians. Uh, it was very, a very. Uh, Marin County had a real strong Italian flavor back in the fifties. Interesting. Okay, yeah. but it was in the late sixties, I guess, and it turned hippie. Uh, yeah, like even that then, well. yeah, it's definitely. And I don't know what you'd call it today because hippies don't exist anymore. But there are people that are kind of like hippies that live there. But I see a couple of, a couple of guys that I know that that kind of wander around town that uh, that have the like. What, what's this guy's name? He calls himself Sierra. The other guy calls himself Ramdas. You know, it's like wow. okay. Ram Dass. Yeah, well, that's, that's actually a famous person who named himself after. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah, I didn't okay. know this until he told me. You know. some, so we have some characters there, yeah. But I don't think Joe DiMaggio minded, would have even minded that so much, but Marilyn Monroe, she wanted to be in the, in the middle of Hollywood, you know, well, where she'd get all the attention. Yeah, that definitely uh, seemed like... She needed the attention. Yeah. She's one of those gals that needed Joe the attention. Joe was very quiet. Joe was just the opposite. And the, thing, the sad thing was they loved each other very much. They... Right in an up for I guess till uh, from the time she died until 1992, 30 years. Every week he would either drop it by or he'd have somebody drop by a dozen red roses on her crypt. Wow, you know, that's how much he loved her. Wow, yeah, you know, it's funny. He's one of those guys who, when he was playing baseball, was not a handsome guy, but then as a as he got older, he became more distinguished. Yeah. yeah, yeah, he did. He did. Uh, it's an interesting thing about Joe the manager. He, his career didn't really last that long. He only played about fourteen years, and, and it was interrupted by the war. But man, when he was playing, you look at how many times he struck out one year. I think it was twelve times. That's too and, much. Yeah, twelve times in six hundred at bats, though. Can you imagine that? That's that's absurd. <laughs> that's like once every fifty times he strikes out. Well, they said t uh, Ted Williams was like that. He yeah, was really like that died. too. Yeah, he was like that. Tony Gwynn. There's another one. That Oh, yeah. You get two strikes on Tony Gwynn. Tony Gwynn had the best, and I, I heard somebody tell me this recently, with two strikes on him, he had the best batting average of anybody in the history of baseball, at least they kept track of. He was hitting something like 310 with two strikes on him. Well, he had a 350 <clears throat> batting average. 350 lifetime batting yeah. average. But hitting 310 with two strikes on you? Yeah, that's usually a pitcher's pitch. Yeah. You know? I mean, you're still getting balls, too. Well, you think you're still getting the guy out seven out of ten times, but there's three times. Is you, you succeed three times out of ten in baseball. That's pretty good. And, then, and isn't it amazing the difference between hitting 250 and hitting 300? Oh it's just one extra hit per week. Yeah, that's right. And that's the difference between like Hall of Fame and, and not. I remember what, I know, a, a, an old time baseball player. Yeah, it's a difference between one clunker, one bleeder, one blooper. You know, one uh, tweener. I love those little expressions. Tweener, yeah. just, uh, uh, baseball. Dying yeah. quail, Dying Texas quail, legal, Texas legal. Legal. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, baseball has all the all the strange little anomalies there. Well, wonder too is, is you know is it the scorekeeper that decides right? It I remember is. during the fifty six game hitting streak, there were a couple of plays that probably should have probably been should have been called errors. Yeah. You know? Well, I mean, I remember there was a pitcher by the name of Sam Jones of the Giants who had a no hitter. He would have pitched a no hitter, but in the ninth inning. A Dodger laid out an infield hit, and it looked like the guy fumbled the ball, the infielder, and the, uh, all the other writers in the press box thought he had fumbled the ball, but the writer who mattered the most was that day the official scorekeeper, and he said, no, that was an error. Uh, so well, it was well, one what out. happened just a few years ago? Was it uh, Joyce was the... Uh, oh, the perfect game. Yeah. yeah, and, and, yeah. And, and he, he, and he really I'm trying to remember who that pitcher was. I and that, the pitcher was so... It was not a great pitcher, but he was so magnanimous about yes. it. Yes. He, he, he told the umpire later. The umpire admit, admitted he made a mistake. Don't worry about it, because he ended up pitching a no-hitter anyway, which I guess is, you know, small consolation. But yeah. Still, uh, you know. Perfect right. game is a perfect game. How many perfect games have pitched? 15 or 20? You know? Crazy. Yeah. Okay, here we go. Here's our last uh, commercial break trivia question. Okay. We, we went from uh, basketball to football, and we got a hockey question. Oh, I like hockey. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Who was the first NHL hockey goalie to score a goal? Oh, it's kind of interesting. Question, yeah. The uh, first email with the correct answer is going to win a free three-day, two-night stay at the Lighthouse Resort. Email Edward at sportsgeekpond101.com. The answer to this hockey question, who was the first NHL hockey goalie to score a goal, Ooh. and you will have known this player. Okay. Even if you don't know too much about hockey, you'll know this player. Okay. Stay with us, Sports Econ 101. We'll come back with some closing comments. Gotta be, gotta be Boom Boom Jeffrey on. Boom Boom. Maybe, 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 maybe. 
Play them all the St. Louis Blues. One of those two. What year was that? Well, the St. Louis Blues would have been the 60, late 60s, maybe? Late 60s. You know, the, you know, I didn't realize this. The St. Louis Blues have not been to a Stanley Cup final since 1969. They were in it the first three years. And the only reason they were in it was, you remember, the original six. Then they had six new teams. In one year, they had six expansion teams. And they all went in one division. Oh. And so they were of lesser quality. So St. Louis won that division three years in a row and went to the Stanley Cup Finals three yeah. years in a row. Because in those days, it was just two rounds, and the best team usually you know, was the first place team. And did they win it? They did. They did not. They Interesting did. thing about hockey, though. They're like the Buffalo Bills of uh, yeah. King yeah. Bill. Oh, yeah. I'll bring this up during the quick thing. Okay, ready? Right, yeah. Right. Welcome back to Lou. Welcome back to Sports Econ 101. Last there you time go. for today. There That's we go. Right. I'm Edward Brown along with uh, Bruce McGowan. Here was our trivia question last month. Who was the first NHL goalie to score a goal? I'm just going to take a wild guess and say Glenn Hall, the St. Louis uh, Blues. No, it was after him. This was actually in the 80s, believe it or not. 80s. Billy Smith of the uh, of the uh, Islanders? No, think Flyers. Oh, what was the name of that come goalie? On, come on. Yeah, I cannot remember his name. Not Pentagon, but... Hex. Hex. Ron Hextall. Oh, Ron Hextall. Yeah, that's right. You know, I was just thinking about hockey. Hockey, if you if you have a mediocre team or even a, a team that barely makes the playoffs, if you get a hot goalie, you can ride that goalie a long way. Look at the San Jose Sharks, what they're doing right now with Martin Jones and Ned. Not a great goalie during the regular season. A good goaltender. He's having a phenomenal postseason. Two shutouts. And the Sharks are, you know, they're, they still have to win three more games as we speak to beat the Blues to get to the finals. But they may get in there partly because this guy's having a great series, great postseason. It's a great, I love that when that happens. That's yeah. a, it's the only sport that's like that. You know, football, baseball, basketball, usually the best teams get in hockey. Sometimes it's a fluke. A guy gets hot in the nets and you can't score. And all you have to do is get a couple of goals for him and support. He's going to, you know, take you all the way. Yeah, if they had some goalie who weighed about 500 pounds, you just, fill up the, the, yeah, just, yeah. just fill up the whole area there. Well, it's it's like like a cross. Move it's got that little tiny net. But they would find a little window. I was watching yeah, a game the other night where I think it was Brett Burns took a pass in one motion, smacked it in into the, into the corner. It was like, how did you do that? Do that. Yeah. I don't know how they do and that. They, and they try. Yeah. Okay, here's our thoughts for the day. Lee Trevino said, there's no such thing as a natural touch. Touch is something you create by hitting millions of golf balls. That's very true. He's a good player. And Ted Williams, we were mentioning his name earlier, said, there has always been a saying in baseball that you can't make a hitter, but I think you can improve a hitter mm. more than improve a fielder. More mistakes are made hitting than in any other part of the game. No question. He is so true. Yeah. All right, tune in next week to Sports Econ 101. We're going to be discussing sports topics from a business perspective and giving away more free vacations for answering trivia questions. I like that. Thanks for listening. Uh -huh. On behalf of our team, I'm your host, Edward Brown. We'll see you next week. Good night, America. So long. All right. Good. Well, that was good. Buzz the buzz. i got to take a lie. I was telling Colette, I said, we should uh, We're going up to uh, this lodge where we do this family 